Well, good morning, Life Church, and good morning to all of you who are joining us online this morning. Hope you're having a great Sunday. Maybe we can make it just a little bit better. We're continuing our series called The God Questions this morning, and this is how I'll start. At the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, he was out calling his very first disciples, and he made it very clear up front what this was going to be all about. He basically said, I want you to follow me, and I will turn you into something that you currently are not. Now, since this is Jesus we're talking about, you might expect him to mean by that something like, follow me and I'll make you more disciplined. I mean, that's what I need. Or follow me and I'll make you more spiritual. Jesus is a spiritual leader, that seems natural. Or follow me and I'll make you smarter. I know everything in the world, you don't, so follow me. Or follow me, I'll make you a better husband, better wife, better employee, better citizen, whatever. The whole bunch of things that you might expect Jesus to say. But instead, Jesus says something that you would have never seen coming. And believe it or not, his call for them that day is the same as his call for you and me. Follow me, and I'm going to make you into something. Now, personally, I would fill in that blank by saying, make me more disciplined, more holy, better leader, better boss, maybe better looking, you know, less gray hair, a little thinner, abs of steel, all that kind of stuff. And Jesus might say, We'll talk about that stuff later. Now, what we're going to read today comes from the Gospel of Mark, the book of Mark. Now, for those that are pretty new to the Bible, there are four accounts of Jesus' life that are written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're known as the Gospels, and they're the first four books of the New Testament. Mark is the shortest book, and it's most action-oriented. We're going to start reading in Mark chapter 1, verse number 16. Here's what it says. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, Jesus could have added there, you have no idea what I'm even talking about yet, but it's going to become a part of who you are, and you're going to love it. You don't have to make yourself a fisher of men. That's something that I'm going to do in you and for you. Now, What must these guys have been thinking? Huh? Fishers of men? Catching people? Clean them, scale them, sell them at the market for 10 bucks a pound? That's a little weird. But look what happens in verse 18, right after this. Verse 18, at once it says, they left their nets and followed him. Now at first glance, that seems strange and a little irresponsible. These guys work for their dad in the family fishing business. Now dads are always hoping that at least one of the kids will stay and take over the family business, but now both the sons are walking away. And they had just met Jesus earlier that day, and now they're just saying sayonara to the boat and to the business. Now let's look at what happens here in verse 19. A little farther up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John, in a boat repairing their nets. He called them at once, and they also followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. Okay, so they all start following Jesus. And the dads don't protest, which seems a little strange, but there's a reason for that, and we'll see it in just a minute. But the cool thing is, if you were to speed read through the New Testament, you'll see that these guys who became fishers of men, that were called by Jesus to become fishers of men, well, they did exactly that. They became men who took the message that Jesus preached, and they began to teach it and spread it in their own words, in their own way, in their own spheres of influence. And God used these guys to relay that message to another generation who understood that it really wasn't just about following, but also about fishing. And then those people shared it with another group, and they fished and shared it with another group who shared it with another group and another group. And now here we are today, 2,000 years later, on the other side of the world, living our lives for a Jewish ex-carpenter. Not because people just followed Jesus, but because they understood that to follow, to really follow, meant to fish. Followers fish. Now, Jesus did what he said he would do. He made them fishers of men. And although at the outset, they probably didn't even understand what all that meant. And it wasn't just these guys. There was a tax collector who became a fisher of men, a Pharisee who became a fisher of men. There was a doctor, a prostitute, a seamstress, a tent maker. They all became fishers of men. There was a guy 
who was demonized and couldn't even function as a normal human being, who was uh, delivered and healed and set free, and he became a fisher. And matter of fact, he went back to his hometown and began a spiritual revival in his own hometown. So all throughout the New Testament, you see this correlation between following and fishing. And at the beginning, they were terrible at it. They kept messing up and Jesus had to keep correcting them. There was one day Jesus was surrounded by a whole bunch of little kids around him and the disciples shooed them away. And Jesus says, what are you doing? I was just about to teach how the kingdom belongs to children such as this. You have to become like a child and you just chased away my illustration. So they had to get the kids back. So, you know, when Jesus called you to, to follow him, it wasn't to make you more religious. It wasn't to make you more disciplined or a better husband or a better wife or more organized or any of that. He wants you to follow and then do in the lives of others what someone did for you, which explains why you're even watching today. Someone shared the message with you. Someone in your life was fishing. Now, what's interesting to me is that none of us signed up for that. I bet nobody watching today came to Jesus and surrendered your life simply for the privilege of fishing for men. That's nobody's motivation. I became a Christian for entirely selfish motives probably the same for you. I became convinced through the Bible and through the influence of others that when you die, you either go to heaven or to hell. Heaven's great, hell not so great. So who wants that? I mean, torment, worms, heat, torture, all that. I mean, who wants that? Then I learned that God loves me even though I'm a screw up and Jesus died to free me from the penalty of my sins and screw ups. And he offers me eternal life with him in heaven. I'm in, where do I sign up? I became a Christian for selfish motives. Most people do. Maybe you did too. I can admit that. Maybe for you it was because you needed God to help you with something. Maybe it was marital problems or an addiction or financial problems or loneliness or whatever. You were in need and God was there to meet your need and reveal himself to you in that way. But then once we got in the door, we found out that being a Christian is so much more than that initial felt need. It's awesome. Following Jesus is the only way to live. I mean, God pours out his love and his joy and his peace and his direction upon your life. It's incredible. His blessings are incredible. I mean, it really is all this and heaven too. So if you're here today and you would not call yourself a Christian at this point in time, it's probably really good that you know this. We like being Christians. We're not just following Jesus because somebody talked us into it. It's the central joy of our lives. We have all, we've been on the outside looking in at one point, so we know what it's like to not be a Christian. We were all fish once, and we're glad somebody went fishing for us. Okay, remember how these guys left the boats, left their father's business and followed Jesus? I mean, it just kind of seems otherworldly. Why would guys just drop what they're doing to follow someone they barely even know? Because despite what the movies and the painting show, Jesus did not glow in the dark. He didn't really have a halo and his robe wasn't shimmering with heavenly sequins. So what was it that happened right before this episode that we just read? That we just read? Well, Jesus had walked up to the fishermen in the morning right after a long, frustrating and fruitless night of fishing. They caught nothing all night long. And now they're getting ready to call it a day. They're putting up their nets and so on. Jesus shows up on the scene and says, go out and drop the nets. Peter and Andrew are looking back to see who's talking. And they say, excuse me, you're a carpenter, right? And you're telling us fishermen to go back out in broad daylight when everyone knows you can't catch fish after spending the entire night out there for nothing at all? Put that down for a catch. A little farther out. I don't have a quarrel with you, teacher. But we've been doing this all night. Nothing. All right. That's your word.
The Bible describes it like this. It says, soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. I mean, think about this. It's a miracle. It's a day changer. It's a budget buster, I mean, to, to say the least. I mean, it, it set their charts going all up and to the right. It's right after this that Jesus says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Now, this had to be stunning to them. They're probably standing there with their jaws dropped. Meanwhile, the dads are on the beach saying, follow him, follow him. That was unbelievable. Don't just stand there, go and do whatever that guy says to do. See, they didn't follow Jesus because they wanted to be fishers of men. They followed Jesus because of what they saw. They followed him because of what he did for them. Now, Jesus probably takes this approach. You know, that's fine, he says. That's fine to start with. But if you follow me long enough, I will lead you beyond the what have you done for me lately mindset. Follow me and I'll take your life and I'll make it something that it's not right now. See, I think Jesus is saying to us, I'll take all the everyday stuff of your normal life and show you how to bring eternal value to the lives of others. You'll see the adventure of living with eternal purpose in your step. Now, if we do that, we'll get beyond just seeing God as gimme, 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 comfort me, meet my needs, get me through school, find me a mate, get me this job, get me this girlfriend, get rid of this boyfriend, and so on. We're so laser focused on the issues of this earthly life we often just forget about eternity. It's so hard for us to see past the bookends of birth and death. Now think about this. Isn't it true, really, that almost all of what we pray about is about this life? My finances, my marriage, my health, my job, my reputation, my parking space. It's, there's nothing wrong with praying for all that stuff. It's a great, there's a great prayers and God listens to every one of them. But they're all temporary stuff. I mean, how often are we talking with God about the soul of a friend, the soul of a neighbor or a family member that doesn't know Jesus yet? That's like forever. See, God can eternalize, not internalize, God can eternalize our daily routine of, routine of life if we will allow him to make us fishers of men. Because then every day takes on new possibilities. Because God will take the details of your life and shape it in such a way where you become the, so perfectly positioned to be the primary fisher of men on behalf of some people in your life. I mean, God can and will use your life because of your past, because of your experiences, because of where you live or where you work or where you go to school or where you buy your pizza, because of your successes and your failures. You are perfectly positioned for someone else to help them find God's best for their lives if you allow Jesus to make you a fisher of men. Because followers end up fishing if they're really following. Now here's one funny reality about all this. We all kind of look at each other and we think, well, you'd be a much better fisher of men than me. And we look, of, uh, look at each other and we figure out reasons why. And we say stuff like, well, you'd be a great fisher of men because you've lived such a great life. You came to faith in Jesus early and you didn't get mixed up in all the garbage I did, so you'd be a great fisher of men. And that person thinks, no, you'd be a great fisher of men. You lived a horrible life. You were one pathetic loser before Jesus got you. No, no, no offense, please. But you've got a great story to tell. Or someone says, you'd be great because you're outgoing and you talk a lot. And then that person says, well, no, no, no. You'd be great because you're quiet and people trust what little you actually say. See how this works? Some people say to me, it's easy for you to fish because you're a preacher. To which I say, no, it's easier for you because you're not. People have their defenses up with me. They think I'm up to something or have some kind of angle. So it's hard to get 100% honest, open conversations. I think you have a great opportunity just as a neighbor or as a parent in the carpool or as one of the gang in cubicle world. We all have a hard time seeing ourselves as effective fishers of men. But here's the truth. God has positioned all of us in our respective worlds so that we might be fishers and sharers of his love. We don't know everything, but we do know what God's done in our lives. My dad was the best at this that I ever saw. 
I mean, he would throw a line out in the water. He would test the waters with anyone and everyone. He didn't push, but he fished. And I remember one day him asking me, and I was young, I was in my early 20s, and he said, just, how's your Christian life going? And I said, to be honest, it's kind of boring. And he looked at me and he said, start leading people towards Jesus. Your life will never be boring again because that's really living. I've never forgotten those words. Now, I know that some people immediately panic when you start talking about reaching out. They picture people knocking on doors with booklets or preaching on street corners. I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the simplicity of having our eyes open to the simple call of Jesus. To follow means to fish. To allow the life-changing message of God's hope to just leak out of your life to the people around you. Because there are people who will listen to you who will not listen to me, and vice versa. Each of us is perfectly positioned for someone. Now, for a moment, I want you to think about a person or the person that was very influential in your coming to faith in Jesus. Let me just tell you three things about that scenario that were key contributors to what happened to you. First, you had probably already heard the message. It wasn't that, you know, probably someone didn't come up to you and say, you know, Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And you said, who did what? I have never heard those words before in my life. This is brand new information. I mean, the message wasn't new. And it really wasn't just the message anyway, wasn't it? It was also the messenger. Something about that person, something about their past, something about their story, something about their personality made you be somewhat open to what they had to say. So it was the message and the messenger. And third, it was your current circumstances. Those three things converge to pique your interest at that time to receive Jesus and follow him. It wasn't just the message. It's the message and the messenger and your circumstances. Those things come together, they come together and ding, it was the perfect time, it all made sense. You could see that this was the moment to cross the line of faith and begin following Jesus. Somebody was fishing and we were fish and we're really glad that we got caught. We like it. We look back on that day and we, we think, thank God, who knows where I would be, what I would be doing had that not happened. And as Christians, listen, we're not better people, we're just better off. We're not better people, we're just better off. We're better off than we were because someone else didn't just follow, but they fished. Now, I wanna give us a little assignment this week before we, before we go home, because I know that we go away from these online services with the very, very best of intentions, but the truth is you're already thinking about lunch and uh, life is gonna hit you like a freight train pretty soon. So here's what I want us to do to kind of mark the moment. Think about a person or maybe the person who is very instrumental in your coming to faith in Jesus and then sit down and write a note to them. Express your thoughts about it. You may or may not even send the note. That's completely up to you. The person that you write to might not even be alive anymore. But the reason to do this is, is really twofold. The first one is to remind us all and remind you that you were a fish once. And the second thing is to remind us of the gratitude in our hearts for the person who led us towards Jesus. See, we can't ever forget that we're here and we're in God's kingdom because somebody was fishing. Somebody was bold enough to talk to me about Jesus. Somebody jeopardized their friendship with me for the sake of leading me towards God's best. Someone invited you to Life Church or to tune in to these online services, or maybe they gave you a book or a CD or something. Maybe they said something like, hey, I, I, I can tell something's going on in your life. Why don't you come with me to church? Or why don't you come with me to this event? Or why don't you read this with me? And I believe you'll be glad that you did. I was thinking about a friend of mine, uh, a peer from high school, that was real influential in my decision to follow Jesus. His name was Gary, and he was kind of a goofy guy, to be honest with you. He and his brother were always talking to me and my brother about Jesus. And so we were always kind of tag team fending them off. 
but in time their words and their lives landed, and both my brother Jim and I became Christians uh, shortly after that. Well, my, my friend Gary died while we were in high school, just shortly after I became a Christian. And this is the letter that I wrote to him. Here's what it says. Dear Gary, as a teenager, I tried to gravitate towards people that I thought were cool. You were not. It's an honest letter. But we became friends and we had some fun times and great memories. But it didn't take long for you to begin telling me what was most important to you, your relationship with Jesus something I didn't really understand. And it made me uncomfortable when you brought it up. And when I shot you down or I dodged your questions about faith, you never gave up. And you saw how he responded. I responded better to invitations to go somewhere than, it, than, I, than I did when you just brought up faith or religion to talk about. So therefore, your invitations never stopped. You brought me into environments where I could see and hear God's word presented in ways that I could understand. And I know now that you were praying for me the entire time that I would surrender my life to Jesus. You weren't even there the night that your prayers were answered, the night that I raised my hand and walked down to finally give my life to Jesus. And when I told you what I did, it was awkward, and I think you punched me in the arm in a typical insecure male teenager sort of way. But I could see in your eyes what it meant to you for that to happen to me. Little did I know, soon after that, your life ended with no warning. I'd never see you again. And I suspect that I never, ever gave you the gratitude that you deserved. I mean, you were shining the light of Jesus. You weren't perfect, but you were sincere. And I'm sure there were times if you were wondering if it ever did any good, wondering if your prayers for me would ever be answered. Well, your prayers were answered and your life mattered. And although I missed my opportunity on earth, the day will come when I will see you in heaven and I'll punch you in the arm and say, thanks. Thanks for fishing. Gratefully, Chip. Just write a little note like that to someone who is instrumental to express your gratitude that that person was fishing and not just following. We'll be eternally grateful to these people, so let's express it to them. Friends, to follow means to fish. If we're really following, then we'll be fishing. Jesus wants to make you that. You don't have to make yourself that. Just yielding yourself to the Lord, He will do it in you. Just open your heart and He'll do it. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you have a call upon our lives, not just to follow you, but also to fish for men and women. Lord, we trust that your work inside of us will continue to shape us into the kind of people who will be aware of those around us and willing to fish when you prompt us. So God, help us to become all we were created to be. We know you can do this, Lord, and now we believe that you will. Thank you, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, Life Church, I want to remind you that you are prayed for often and loved always. And we're looking forward to the time we can come back together in person. It won't be long. Be faithful in the meantime. And until we meet again, let me leave you with this. Go in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, the God who came still comes. And the God who spoke still speaks. Have a great Sunday. Happy fishing.